So welcome to the second and last, I believe, season of Enclave. I'm Ray Armentrout. Jean Huving, Jean Huving and I organized this series together. We're going to try something a bit different this time. We're going to, we found that we both had things to say about today's reader, Carla Harriman. And so we're going to experiment for the first time with a joint intro. The audience will remain muted and a chat function turned off during the reading to reduce stray noise and promote concentration and also protect us from Zoom bombing because we had one of those in the first uh, part of the series. So before we get started, I'm gonna tell you what's coming up. Next week, October 18th, Erica Hunt will be reading. Then October 25th, Rodrigo Toscano. November 1st, Susan Gervitz. November 8th, Monica Yoon. November 15th, our very own Charles Alexander. November 22nd, Liz Willis. And on November 29th, Laylee Long Soldier. So before we get to our introduction, I, I'm just gonna tell you a brief bit about Jean. Jean is a professor of interdisciplinary disciplinary arts at the University of Washington at Bothell. She is a poet and a scholar, her most recent Poetry collection is Mood Indigo. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Jean. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, Ray and I fought over who was going to introduce Carla. So we both decided to split the introduction. So here's my half. <clears throat> we have all heard of the open poem or open poetry. Is there such a thing as open art. If so, one might begin with Carla Herman's oeuvre as an example of open art. Carla's work begun in the 1970s refuses the solidity of prefabricated form, genre, medium, or discipline. While her work has been characterized as poet's theater or performance and also as cross-genre, or non-genre writing, I would suggest that the brilliance of her work is in how it repels categorization. While it is critique, it is also poetry. While disquisition, it is poet's theater. While performance, it is concrete or material language. This body of work is brilliant, ceaseless activity. Each book or project taken up afresh as if Carla's life depended on it. Let me count the ways. There are more than 20 books, including two works published under scholastic or university imprints. Many, many, many performances and or events. For a sampling of works and titles, Check out her recently published Sue in Berlin, her co-edited volume, Lust for Life, on the writings of Kathy Acker, or her opera, Gardener of the Stars. But why is this open art, as possibly distinguished by the emergence in the last few decades of an ever larger body of experimental or innovative writing, that flirts or crosses with performance, multimedia, installation, and collaboration, all aspects of Carla's practice. Is the very codification of these practices short changing art? I'm thinking here of the current demand that work be performant, be performative, be multimedia or be collaborative as preceding the work itself as a form of prefabrication or institutionality that closes the art. Carla writes, when the edifice of institutionality dissolves, wonder occurs. Or I might say when the edifice of institutionality dissolves, art occurs. I'm not saying that Carla is the only open art practitioner, but she is an 
early and important exemplar. Her work is open art because its language or its words are never subordinated to its presentational mode. Carla's words are poetry and critique, barbed and evocative, political and indifferent. As Carla writes, she who is subordinated within various communal, discursive, and lived contexts cannot be configured. I am interference. Or as I would put it, she, in all its pronomial amplitude and variance, so her recent publication, Sue in Berlin, she writes, each body subject to law is outside it like me and Sue, reborn in every uprising, prepared for what comes next, we may very well be the vessels of unborn things trying to get out. Okay, I'm happy to turn the introduction over to Ray Armentrout. And uh, I will say briefly, check out Ray's most recent publication, Conjure, if you haven't. And so now Ray will conjure Carla. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jean. There never was a rose without a thorn. Carla's selected works published by City Lights in 1995 is dedicated to Barrett and to play. I think it's useful to think of Carla's body of work in terms of play. Play is about pleasure, of course. But it is also about recognizing rules, the rules of a game. As Carla points out in Magic and Rousseau, refusal more than anything ends play. Play sometimes involves the putting on and casting off of identities. Playing with identity can, of course, be subversive, destabilizing. This is one of its pleasures. Throughout her career, Harriman or Carla, <laughs> has wittily decentered male and especially male intellectual identity. To quote again from Magic and Rousseau, let's pretend Jean-Jacques Rousseau is the pawn in our game. This piece or story or poem is modeled on a child's board game. Rousseau is made to advance around a board by means of parks and boulevards, unless, of course, he is called up by the person at the center of the board. Quote, she is a personage of great power, a witch, and no one in the game recognizes her presence. Or perhaps she is the writer behind the text. But let's leave Rousseau in his predicament and move on. I've always loved Carla's piece called The Male, a faux anthropological exploration of a hypothetical male mind. It begins, would you prefer the pancakes, the examples, or the words? Oh, I have been used as an example so many times, said the male. I think I, do I think, said the male. Pancakes are good, I reminded him. Then there's her piece called Orgasms in Adorno's Noise. Here she subjects Adorno to a kind of manids bacchanal. Everyone now began to tear at Adorno. An orgasm is an elegy. I can't explain this rationally. Orgasms is a kind of linguistic orgy. Try saying, low light lit, little tick flea migrant sip pussy wit twill low. And you'll see. I can't end though without recommending memory play, which has been produced a number of times. I don't know how many, but a number and is also a volume published by O Books. I think this would be a great time for a revival of its production. One character, Reptile, starts by asking, who is the bully? Always a great question, but especially now. And so, from the center of the board, I invoke that personage of great power, Carla Harriman. <laughs> Hello, thank you for being here. 
Can you hear me? Is it, am I a good distance from the computer? Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, it's just thrilling to see all of you here. And um, since Memory Play was recently republished in a um, volume from Split Level Press called A Voice to Perform, One Opera, Two Plays, um, I wasn't planning to read from Memory Play today, but now that you mention it, um, let me see if I can locate. Um, okay, I'm just going to extend a tiny bit, Ray, from what you said. Thank you, Jean and Ray, for those that amazing introduction. I'm sort of spinning from it a little bit, but. Um, Here's Reptile, who is the bully? Pelican, the spitting image of continental drift. Fish, envy is the disease of the 90s as opposed to Pelican, the person. It must be sellable. It must be way up there, but it must not make the normal consumer feel small. It must be way out there but something like what the regular kind of person sees in himself, something that can expand. Fish, you must be a toy inventor. The image on the outside of the box is hot and fierce. Inside, the toy itself is gray and cold. From this we learn that, that toys are the souls of aggressors. So thank you for reminding me of the play. <laughs> um, it would be fun to do it again soon. I'm going to um, now go to a little poem sequence that uh, precedes the time, the COVID time that we're in by a little bit, and it's called The Creeley Dreams. Actually, also published by Split Level in the first issue of Split Level Journal, which is online. One, conveyance. Then it wasn't a young woman assisting with a car trip, was it? To Pacifica Radio and I will strip poems from a book with his name on the cover. It's a hefty road to the station, the trail ends above freeways. We need streets, but listen, the phones, loved in houses, none knew. Two, print. A note with T-O-I-E and L for light, toil to toilette, let it be a hoot and a baby toy, a scheme after Creeley, a wound of tiny paradise. A winding pastoral returns to a canvas through which elephants appeared, tilting people forward. Three, frontal. A vow, a game of compassion. If one thought follows swiftly on another, why does this one lead to alt-right Harvard postdocs? A vow, a game, if one compassion thought swiftly on another followed, does this one lead right to, sorry, a bad connection? Get your palimpsest over here, over there. Don these sandals my mother wore in the Great Depression. Four, in animator. This tonality is female beanie seen if it's like someone needs you 
and you don't need anything. It's fine that way. The squiggle below the passion plane forages for uncensored truth. Five, my middle name is Ruth. This has nothing to do with, this has nothing to do with, this has nothing to do with myth. And then this is also, um, well, this is of and preceding the event that we are currently all sharing. And it's uh, called Daydream 8 from a series of daydreams, some of which are included in a long um, essay that some people called a poem called Artifact of Hope. Night of the Long Knives, or Dirty Grandpa Who Can't Keep His Mouth Shut. A fist rises from proverbial pockets, and two oofs fall out of the media bus like Gerald Ford, one fawning on the rotten and glaring wishes for revenge of the other. God, help us when they move in on the bitch. It is no guarantee after the election that the fist will be faithful to the oof itself inconstant as a furniture store in Palm Beach. The oof of the it, she, I vocab furnishings knows a zero or two inside take all or nothing futures. Their surrogate equipment branded dirty grandpa which is itself identical to the oof itself with one difference. The dirty grandpa is a familiar cliche and the oof, the grammatical rubbish of riches and violence rotting within. It's poison nourished by Tic Tacs and media outlets has nowhere near been fully excreted. Will their fists, devices, pocket their devices, fists, when the dirty grandpa who can't keep his mouth shut is no longer provided a free night on the town by those at the network's top. That one seemed somehow relevant um, to the moment. And so I'm going to read um, a, a little bit from Sue in Berlin, from the title piece. I've read it a fair amount, but also there are quite a few people who haven't heard it. And I'm not, I'm just going to, it's a long, more or less narrative poem with some divergences from narrative. And I'm just going to read a, a short passage from it. From nowhere, a distinguished looking gentleman approaches our band of withdrawn politicos. He's dressed in a pale suit, his extended hand lit by the moon glows whitely and Sue disappears. We figure she's avoiding him. That's right, he's saying to May. She's my daughter and I've traveled some distance. Are you from? He asks familiarly around here, separating us one from the other in the tone of the question, only you and me are real, the implication soon to be old friends, as if we each infantile crept from nowhere, hyperspace, a horror flick, the heart of darkness, Palestine, to welcome him and help him out, who reciprocally had come to help each of us out if we wanted to be helped out for a small price or exchange of services, the location of Sue, who is not really his daughter. I'm not that old, May says you are. Sue, who is in truth an ally, did him a favor. He's here to repay it. 
I explain that Sue is a bit of an anarchist. Reciprocity makes her laugh. You didn't know what you were getting into somatic existence, falling profits when you got involved with Sue. She's probably somewhere nearby, pissing in her pants, laughing. I don't think we're talking about the same person. Maybe he's a little nervous, so I tell him. I'm cold, could use an extra jacket. He puts it around my shoulders and says he's ready for Sue. I remind him that we aren't talking about the same person, that we don't know his Sue. Ours is a breakaway type about to explode, her feet strapped to bomb balls. She walks on them, supported by canes. Her clit is a fuse she got from a suicide bomber. She'll be soaring soon to claim her rightful place, colloquially speaking, inside whole, because I won't give him his jacket back. He steps out of his pants, hands them to me, disappears into the underground, wearing only bikini briefs, a white shirt, and ugly tie. I've told this story about a million times, but it keeps coming back to haunt me. Every time I look down, I think about the guy needing Sue for no apparent reason. Even now that I have found her, I wonder where she disappeared to. It gets spooky. I mean, I was standing at my feet. I was standing looking at my feet in the dark. I can't see the street five floors below. The rent's cheap, tons of kids, good shopping. And us, without Sue, the guy gave me his clothes. I saw him go under. Sue just Oof, it's her who keeps me on the story. His pants don't mean a thing to me, though. I keep them around, useless as they are. They make no sense whatsoever. Ishaiza, a broken cork. When Sue comes back, she's looking like a robot. She heard it. She heard it. She heard it. I wanted me. I wanted me. That's what she talks about in her robot way. She can be cruel, usually is cruel. It's Programmed, she says, to say things you don't want to hear. She's a machine running on smooth, expressing desires she doesn't really have. It's her father who bothers her, and no pants definitely isn't. Her father acted like a clown. None of his three cars worked. Something cement fell on the job. He couldn't move, then told her he loved her the wrong way. That was the last straw. He didn't know what she was going to do with the information. It wasn't information. He was entirely incapable of comprehending. Nonsense is the only thing that makes sense. Where did no pants go? She wants to know. What he did was pretty funny, Sue. I need you to stop talking. 10 more minutes. Then we will run the film backwards. She talks for 10 minutes. That's why we put up with her. Plus, I've locked myself out of my apartment hole in the wall with a mean little door. So we're just outside some boarded up dive with a bunch of equipment. She doesn't stop and we don't want her to. Nobody can explain me away. Can anybody explain you away? This is her next topic, being explained away. It's her, the whole person, robot, the robot and the cat. When I climb, onto someone's lap and spit, that's when I'm acting like a cat or when I lead you guys to clean up your own mess and keep mine to myself, not sharing in your shit. Would you like to live in an airport? This is when something strange happens. A bulldozer starts up behind us. We're running backwards away from it and Sue just stands there. She looks the guy in the eye who's driving it. He doesn't know what he's doing and he doesn't know what she's doing. It's sublime. Some kid who's passing out ads for rock bands that sponsor extreme right candidates 
runs over to her, grabs her upper arm, yanks her out of the way. She's laughing. It's crazy. The kid asks her to meet him at the party with the band. The bulldozer cuts the engine. Everything's quiet. The bulldozer driver just sits there. Sue blinks at the boy, blinks again, a plastic doll. You didn't have to do that, she says. Sure I did, he says, not meaning it. Like he's shouldering a secret, taking advantage of me like that. She blinks, slut. He slips up, cuts out with his scrubbed up neck, turning red. That's how it is with her. Strangers never figure except something I'll tell you about later. We're bored with this construction site. So we go hang out in front of the Russian Kino to see if we can get into a show. All you have to do is wait for the ticket taker to open the door, take tickets, go to the next door. It's a DDR film about a painter named Goya. I know I've heard the name. Sue says it's her dad. He had a lot of children and he died in the 1968 rebellion. That makes you at least 37. You're right. You're always right. It's about time I left school. We tried to figure out what takes Goya, who is no way your dad, Sue, so get off it. This is the Inquisition to the breaking point. And whether or not it was insanity that saved Goya from execution, his wits, or the fear of transubstantiation. Each body subject to law is outside it like me and Sue, reborn in every uprising, prepared for what comes next. We may very well be the vessels of unborn things trying to get out. Okay, so now I'm switching gears to some recent writing, which um, is being written in the mode of numbered improvised dialogues. And I'm, um, it's called Good Morning. It's part of something I think that I'm making called Against Interpretation of the Heartland. And I'm going to, uh, all, all of the dialogues either um, implicitly or explicitly begin in and around Good Morning. Five, Good Morning again. Yes. In the immediacy you had fancied. It's not all that immediate. There are lots of droplets in the air today. It's almost gooey, just a shade denser than sticky. And it's morning when the residue is usually lifting, accompanied by a pierce and a promise. Is sensation always that abstract to you? My chest feels a bit like it's sinking into my stomach, but my stomach can handle it. Not always. Well, today it is. Always doesn't mean a lot these days, does it? It means we are headed out and we are not headed out. Let's go hold up the tent. I would prefer to follow my thoughts to the shoreline. That's where the tent's placed. Which one? The one for which we are responsible. Why am I feeling a little suspicious? I mean, the tide comes in and out, so at the very least, it's going to get soggy, and we don't have the strength to hold it up if it gets weighted with water, gradually getting pulled down to sea level, getting dragged out into the ocean, sinking, tossing, blending with kelp beds. I thought we were referring to the lake shore. Lakeshore Drive, next stop, exit at the Drama Queen. Don't go past the exit or you'll end up at the Reign of Terror. There's got to be a way to, what? Talk about my murderous thoughts without threat of consequences? Do you have a view on the common good? 
Of course. It's there in the liminal space of sometimes overused or overdetermined concept, that space. But there you have it, not holding up the damn tent with all of its, oh my God, don't get me going, medical ethics or errors, child care programs and underpaid skilled labor, interpretations of the law that support insurance companies' interests over these carrier pigeon gifts cards, debates about heroes risking their lives for the common good because there is no choice, which of course is the the definition of the hero. While the heroine has retreated to the bathtub to self-pleasure as a response to male dominance of the revolution happening in Gail Scott's novel. That's an oversimplification. And identification. She is thinking, which is something that pleasure aids and obliterates. Below the street, or should I say out because I am trying to swim out to it. First, I was out in a little dinghy fishing. Then there was that blubbery dude in the water with a bear and steering with a rudder. How many hands does he have? As many as he can afford. I assume we are out of butter. Seven. Under the circumstances, the day got off to a mixed start with nothing indifferent about it. I woke up longing for those harbor contours again after a night of leaving baggage on trains and renting cars that wouldn't stay in park and joy rides in them that led to crashes. That's a bit of mayhem. Glad to know you are figuring out the difference between dreams and reality. You know, I wanted to talk to you about how you mistook reality for a dream the other day. It bothered me. Why? Obviously, because I was literally there with you and you didn't notice. I felt almost abandoned, but also just worried that you've been under too much stress. And how are you this morning? I am waiting to see how things unfold. I've noticed before that you don't mind my changing the subject. It's when we stay on the subject for a while that you get, what about the books? Did you find any in that bonfire lot? Is that where you just went? I don't want mildew in the house. I've got blow up in other stories. I'm supposed to protect you from all this and ecological thinking drying out on a table. I set up next to the mulch heap on the asphalt outside. I know where the mulch is, remember? What happens if it rains? They'll be ruined for good. I'm considering putting them to memory, but of course I will keep my mind on the weather so that this doesn't happen. Memorizing three books? I I mean, they're getting rained on. I'm pretty efficient at bringing the avocados in before they get pelted, but you can't bring mildewed books into the house. I know something will come to me, I'm pretty sure. Nine. I was inside and you were outside and there was a reassuring glow to the depiction. It involved there being women inside that cliche and others, but who I am not sure out there where you were and neither of us was displeased. Not exactly displeased. How do you know? Because I was there. Look, this is another instance in which something I am describing didn't really happen. A flicker woodpecker just dropped along the edge of the planting area you just weeded, then took off. A red spot, white spot, take off. That really happened, but not, wait a minute. You were going to say, but not the divided world you had dreamt up as some kind of remedy to a discomfort you can't quite put your finger on. And then you realize there, there is something this word divided and it stopped the sentence. Yes, that's true, or at least as true as day X. Are you able to think about the future and where we're at with equal weight? An extra scraggly blue jay with a blotched white marking seems to be taking over the territory along one entire length of fencing. Then a dinky finch flits over to the window while you aren't there and peeks inside where I am making a record of what happened. Maybe it's interested in the orchid. Those flowers are fat. They are in it, 
or the good life. So calm as this bitter coffee hits the nerve center. Her nerves reached the center of her dress, Malcolm de Chazal. This thing is not a dress. Not a, not a dress, perhaps, but dress. I am trying to elevate conversation to the general condition. The good life, divisions and divides, those terms that pull one out of one's immersion. The fat orchids dye their ambivalent registers to lucid white statements when we ignore their agency. Thought you liked orchids, but those words are hard to chew. If you chew words, I can assign human qualities to plants. And thus they began the rendezvous, a meeting that stretched into hours, a lifetime. It was a lifeline wrapped around them such that they could both see rain when it rained. And one could observe the other kicking off their shoes without this having any particular meaning. Or the other could join a protest and still breathe the ether of time they occupied in a world of indefinition as the great poet Lorenzo Thomas might call it. 10. Yesterday, there was a cat, but today there is the declaration on the topic of thinking. Yesterday, the cat appeared as if in a dream, but she was real. Don't be so, she was, she, I'll call her a thought balloon, which was so large, you couldn't see the entire form all at once of the balloon, but you could tell it was a thought balloon. Her name is Sphinx, the guardian of thought. That's a way to describe it, but is it correct? She's a dark gray tabby sitting very still, regal in demeanor with one paw raised and stretched perpendicularly to her body. At the right moment, she swats the air with the paw, then resumes her pose. She's an immortal. She's right there on the porch, the one crowded by overgrown vines. She was in a clear space, which was unnerving because it was the space and not the cat that didn't seem real. It held her drawn in thought, yes, but today she's she's always had she always has a very sweet face. She couldn't wipe that wide-eyed, bewildered, I don't want this wisdom off her face if she tried. Today is the declaration on the topic of thinking, which it turns out is more prevalent than evidence suggests. Are you alluding to the scheme of bourgeois introspection? I am waking up in the morning seeing how you can stand in a laundry room with other people competing over dryers and think. You can think about what it means that those present are those, are those present. And you can think about something else that has nothing to do with who got there first and who has to wait, like justice. So what do you think of the cat, the one on the porch, Sphinx? the one in the thought bubble who swats the void as precisely as a child of Newt. Oh, Newt. Yes, the cosmos seems to have left her alone in its scandalous light shows. I'm worried that I've gotten a little too close to what that might feel like to be absorbed into what has given you over to isolation. Really, I can't see what we are living in I really, I can't see that we are living in such passive times. If this were a Frank O'Hara play instead of what we like to call real life, I would suggest a cocktail as it is late enough in the morning if you have nothing else going on for the rest of the day or not until two or so. I would regale you with some narrative about something I had lost or left behind in a fashion that would telegraph this isn't really about me, but the telling is. The telling is about the time that passes through you as you tell it. Even if I was present in all of those events about the cat, that's what you are about to bring this back to. Yes, 
but I hereby declare my objection to the simulacra of cosmic entities. I prefer to grind my stories into a materialist miasma of language scorched with memory, memory that doesn't give over to performance or the agency of the memoirist who has heroically overcome yet another personal debacle and offered up their story to help all who have likewise suffered heal. I want to feel grouchy when I go back in time, grind the logo of my life, changing grand affair with the limb of a frayed plaster cast I stole from the Stalin graveyard. Anyhow, I prefer truisms to mysticism. Have you noticed? Well, this is 11. It's been a minute, but last night, I was trying to figure out how I got to San Clemente, San Clemente during a pandemic and all those fires. It was really R's place and they were there, R and his people, and I hadn't ever heard of their having it, the San Clemente place, which was a childhood spot where my parents had purchased an apartment building for a couple of thousand dollars with a friend and we had to spend the weekend painting the interior so they could sell it for a couple thousand more. It was on the main street, dilapidated, before there were many people. Now it's another gleaming beach town about to collapse and catch fire. There, there I was, sitting in my favorite shorts on a bunch of old newspapers next to a paint can and holding a brush coated in pastel green slime. It was impossible to cover floorboards correctly. My job was going to be checked, and this made me want to vomit. The smell of vomit, sweet car trip brushing into the walls, gave me a longing for the beach nearby. And now, not having heard of Ars Beachfront Cottage, I was just instantaneously inside it to see for myself. It was maybe six, eight feet from the water on flat land, imminently sinkable sand land with things of nature, mussels under and birds over, walled out by what was so apparently between us and the elements. The windows almost floor to ceiling broadly, or do I mean cursorily, kept me wondering if they were plastic. And maybe there were only st these were only stained by salt water smashed into them. I'm sure there wasn't much fog. The shoreline was getting covered by the tide coming in, and I was thinking about, well, to ask R if they were concerned about water damage. When I looked down at the morning paper and its discourses of menace, power, and normalization, there is a display of faces in squares so small I need a magnifying glass to see them. These configure whiteness, race, and power into categories that the news media cover most. Sports, business, politics, fashion, heads of prestigious universities, and film and music entertainment. One notices that they are a lot more, there are a lot more people of color designated as, quote, most powerful in the country who occupy some positions in law enforcement, legal services, and the federal legislative, yes, well, good morning. I apologize for being unconversant. What are you, what you are saying feels a little depressive. Are you okay? Yes, I was going to ask you about that last thing. You mean the house paint? No, but when was lead paint banned? I think it was 1978. The job we were doing was in 1962. My parents had saved their pennies and they were feeling optimistic about the Kennedy era. I wanted to ask you about your traveling by yourself to San Clemente. I, was, I wasn't there, right? No, it just happened because there was something I needed to envision here where I left you, I think. You can tell I was drifting in and out when you were talking about last night, senor childhood trips to San Clemente, and then I think you were saying something about power. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry, I wasn't quite following you. I'm still waking up, and I was thinking about a goofy 
long poem I just finished reading, and by the word tether, which isn't in the poem at all, seemed to be the best way to grasp it conceptually. Maybe that's because we go about the house with the puppy tethered to one or the other of us. You know, I don't think the news media has a very good understanding of power. There's something narrow, aspirational, and data-driven in it. The virtue signaling of a command of facts, the version of power as saleable good. What's your point? Okay, so I'm going to end uh, the reading with um, a uh, kind of edited sequence at the um, end of uh, a play called Hana Cut In. And um, in this book, A Voice to Perform, that just came out from Split Level Press, I'm going to read a little bit about Hana Cut In and um, not really tell you what the uh, performance constraints are because it would be kind of elaborate and take a while. I'm just, I'm just reading it for the text today. Hana Cut In is a play of superimpositions of memories, citations, and historical references cut into the noisy patterns of present time. There are references to Valises paintings and an artist, Simone, as well as the University Art Museum of California, Berkeley, especially the art museum where I was an where I was employee in the early 1980s. There are also references to television and film. These include Margaret von Trotta's Hannah Arendt and the original 1961 documentation of the Eichmann trial. The voices of Marion and Hannah are surrogates for my mother and Hannah Arendt. The manual typewriter, which is part of the performance, but not my reading, is an everyday tool and sound making machine that for me remains a powerful object of another time. The typewriters performed as musical instruments in the play also allude to the typewriter as an instrument used as one, at one time or another by any of the figures in the play. They are also presences in both Trotta's film and the telecast of the Eichmann trial. I'm going to start five, uh, which um, begins in the University Museum and then drifts away. The jangle of these art institutional dynamics, they're mixing together under the pressure of the divergent interests to which the museum responds, were magnified for me in the silence of art. I am visiting this threshold, thinking about something or someone else. It is unclear to me whether it is she or her art that shadows the shaping of this scene, number five. I am thinking about Simone's doors. The clay forms are narrow and of unequal height, their tops lopsided as if strafed by war or touched by time. They are lined up in descending order. The scaled doors become as musical and temporal as they are spatial and tactile. They hover between concept, story, ancient history, and now between remnant of and passageway to a lost interior, a pleasure, a secret, a statelessness. They are indications of the regions of thought that time sculpts through Syrian tragedy and Mesopotamian afterlife between integral and interval, between progression and procession. The things in the museum condense into an impression that includes vaulted ceilings, microphones, or the disuse of them. Somewhere there may be a painting in which a spiral jets off to the left side 
of a canvas. Any of these written notes could be sonic cues. Or Hana cuts in with a vision of ontological roots, or the notes just hang out where they are like a spiral jutting off to the left side of the canvas. This particular spiral possibly doesn't exist, or it is reintroduced as the name of an African-American artist collective in the 1960s, Spiral. It may signal a painting, a politics, a system, or it devolves as replica, the replica, the replica with the signature and the microphone, the reverb and the verb, verb. It is often noted that Hannah Arendt didn't have much to say about modern or contemporary art. And this is not a performance about Hannah Arendt, although it depends upon her. Hannah Arendt cuts in and changes things. For example, my mother, who did love art, especially Japanese prints and gardens, was embarrassed about the crisis of everything. So I packed up my valises. I was holding them, one in each hand, behind the sofa, near where my mother sat watching television. The small black one contained the story of my life to date, and the larger one, which you could still tuck under a seat or in a small baggage compartment, held in the other. I wasn't really a thinking about this being lopsided. She was watching television in black and white, overview shot of trial room, the tops of heads, man in booth. This becomes Eichmann seated with two uniformed men cut to close up of an attorney in robes, cut to Eichmann in huge spectacles seated between two uniformed men with a third seated just on the outside of the booth. This becomes bulletproof cut to discussion of men in courtroom headphones, machines, which become translation machines, cut to Eichmann, guarded people in the courtroom seated, something in what becomes German. Someone instructs in English to give the voice solid intonation. Don't do any work. Don't read it. Solid. Some muffled German may I have, but cut to people in courtroom, a woman in a long wool coat, close up of attendees, cut to Eichmann, and a man in uniform cut to man in trial room, writing on a pad, silence, except the spray of the recording. Shh. My favorite defense of Hannah Arendt's characterization of the new evil is Judith Butler's, who explains it as a new form of hideousness that is able to pass itself off as the normal. As I was saying, a child is the hero of her own life, and I packed up my valises, one black and small, one plum and less small, one with a life story and the other with stuff seeking the future. I didn't notice much that I was carrying them lopsided. Well, thank you for listening for this good long time. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. It was great to see everybody. Thank you. It was wonderful to hear you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Carla. It was great. Loved hearing the new work. Well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>